Hello and welcome to the W.D. Jordan Rare Books and Special Collections Department at the Queen's University Library. My name is Dr. Brendan Edwards and I'm the Curator of Rare Books and Special Collections. The W.D. Jordan Rare Books and Special Collections Department is the home of Queen's University Library's Rare and Special Collections. Rare books and special collections are physical items that the University Library has collected over its long history that are difficult to replace or in some cases impossible to replace or collections of books that come with an interesting provenance. Today I'll be introducing you to the W.D. Jordan Rare Books and Special Collections collection of Gothic fantasy. The Gothic fantasy collection came to the university in about 1967. It was acquired from Jack's Bookshop in Toronto. And Jack's Bookshop had acquired this collection from a Mr. Lamb, who was a civil servant in the city, and he had passed away around that time, and his widow had brought this collection to Jack's Bookshop. Queen's University Library was aided by Dr. Charles Pullen from the English department in terms of negotiating to acquire this collection. Here we are standing in the Gothic Fantasy Collection in its present location, and you notice that some of the material is still in boxes. The reason these materials are still in boxes is because many of them are very fragile. The magazines are often referred to as pulp magazines, and the reason they're called pulp magazines is because they were literally published on pulp paper, paper that was highly acidic uh, and very cheap. So unfortunately it doesn't last very long and by keeping things in boxes we're keeping them out of the light and away from hands and that will prolong the life of this material somewhat. In 2019 the W.D. Jordan Rare Books and Special Collections Department hosted an exhibit on the Gothic Fantasy Collection called Beyond the Penny Dreadful. This exhibit was put together by Services Coordinator Kimberly Bell, and it did feature several titles and books that related to gender and stereotyping that are held within the Gothic Fantasy Collection. Although the exhibit is since closed, this exhibit catalog is available as a resource to help you identify other potential titles and stories of interest from the collection. Hi, my name is Natasha Grismanovich and I'm the Conservator for Special Collections and Archives here at Queen's University Library. So we're going to take a look at um, a couple items in the Gothic Fantasy Collection and talk about um, their current condition and how we mitigate risks um, when storing the collections and also when handling. So some of the um, inherent condition issues that we can expect to see with the pulp paper, pulp fiction uh, magazines are the, the crumbling and brittle paper. We can notice that the paper edges are often uh, flaking and missing uh, pieces along the covers and we can also see that there's damage often done to the spine as well. So the spines were often um, just glued in and so once the adhesive starts to get a bit brittle, it starts to pull away from the text block. So when viewing these materials in person, um, we don't use gloves because we want to have a bit of that tactile sense when we're handling the object so that we don't um, inadvertently cause damage during handling. So we just use clean dry hands when handling the material. We might ask ourselves, why is this paper so brittle? Um, and, um, you know, following the invention of the printing press and the surge in uh, paper production, um, paper started to be produced um, primarily with wood pulp. And uh, wood pulp has a much shorter um, fiber structure than some, of, some other uh, paper types that are made out of uh, cotton or linen rag. And so, because of these shorter fiber lengths, we have an inherently uh, weaker paper structure. As well, there is um, there are acidic byproducts in the paper as well, like lignin, uh, which are found within uh, vascular plants. So lignin 
um, is what keeps a plant rigid and strong, but um, within a paper structure it's actually quite acidic. So this acidity um, ultimately ends up catalyzing some hydrolysis, which is just the breaking of oxygen bonds um, within these long cellulose um, molecules. So as time goes by and the paper naturally ages and goes through um, oxidation and hydrolysis, it really is sped up by the um, wood pulp content within the paper. And so we can see how it, it, it yellows quite quickly and it becomes brittle quite quickly. Today we want to talk about women of science fiction and how the Gothic Fantasy Collection includes a number of examples of women who are authors and also women as they are represented in science fiction and in Gothic Fantasy. A major part of how women were represented in pulp science fiction is through the vibrant cover art. These magazines were designed with bold images to really stand out on the newsstands and they often featured illustrations from one of the stories inside showing some kind of action scene or something uh, from the story to grab the reader's attention. The cover art often features situations where the women are being abducted, rescued, chased by some alien horde. There's always some kind of action going on in the image, but usually the women themselves are depicted as hypersexualized, passive, sometimes entirely asleep. Um, and not really contributing to the adventure going on in the image. Something else that you'll notice about the women depicted in the cover art of these magazines is that they are almost always white. And if they're not white, they're usually alien. Uh, so there's not a lot of representation here of women of color. The very few exceptions tend to feature women of color who are uh, in some way an object of desire supporting the hero of the story. Science fiction pulp magazines largely emerged as a kind of uh, branch off of colonial adventure stories and westerns, which were really popular magazine literature at the time, along with things like fantasy literature and detective stories. Uh, science fiction stories often borrowed a lot of tropes, images, and storylines from these previously established genres. So you have a pretty standard um, narrative pattern in a lot of pulp science fiction. You have a hyper-masculine individualist hero who has to overcome danger on some exotic planet um, or face some kind of foe, and you have a passive female character who needs to be rescued. So it makes these science fiction stories a little bit different from the kinds of stories you would find in uh, adventure stories, besides the, fact, besides the settings of being in outer space or on another planet or in an underground subterranean society, um, is that they tend to valorize a different type of masculine hero. Because science fiction stories wanted to initially at least be didactic and really engage with science, their heroes tended to be clever. They tended to work through the problems that they encountered using logic, using technology, and using their intelligence in some way, in addition to being athletic and, uh, and courageous. These stories often also featured a scientist character who was sometimes the hero, but more often an elderly man who uh, was a bit of a loner, a bit eccentric, but always a genius. Sometimes uh, that scientist is a protagonist and the uh, hero of the story is his apprentice or a journalist friend, um, but sometimes the genius scientist becomes the villain, having run amok with his science. And the female characters in these stories, in addition to serving as a love interest for the hero, were also usually in some way related to the scientist as a, a daughter, a niece, or maybe a secretary working for this genius science to the scientist to sort of place her in the context of the story. Women were never portrayed as the scientists and very rarely portrayed as the heroes of the stories themselves. 
which in addition to depriving women from having an agentive and um, active role in the story, also didn't really reflect the reality of science at the time. Enrollment in science programs in universities throughout North America and Europe uh, for women was increasing gradually over the 20s and 30s and increasing even more over the 40s and 50s. So there were actually quite a number of women practicing science at the time, but you don't really see that reflected in these stories. So one of the amazing things about this collection is that it enables us to see the stories that we're studying this year in our syllabus in their original form. Three of the short stories we're studying this term can be found in their original printed materials here in this collection. Uh, you can see Leslie F. Stone's The Conquest of Gola. This week's readings, uh, Judith Merrill, That Only a Mother, is also available. And in a few weeks we'll be reading No Woman Born by C.L. Moore, and that copy is available here as well. And it's amazing because you can not only take a look at the stories themselves, but also see how they're laid out in context with the other materials inside the magazines, the advertising, the other stories, and the original artwork that was printed along with the stories, which sometimes isn't always reproduced in the anthologies where we can normally find these stories now. The early days of science fiction were largely a male-dominated space, both in terms of the authors and the publishers. And so there were a number of strategies that women had to adopt in order to break into that field and get their work published. So in this issue here, we have a unique case of one female author writing not only under her own name, this is Margaret St. Clair, who was a pretty well-established science fiction writer under her own name, but she also used some pseudonyms, including Wilton Hazard. So here you have two stories by Margaret St. Clair, one under her own name and one under one of her pseudonyms. Here is the story under Margaret St. Clair, and even then it's under M. St. Clair. Readers probably would have been familiar with her name by the time this publication came out, so they might have clocked that it was Margaret St. Clair, but you still see an initialization here. Also just note there's some wonderful artwork. So here we have another famous example of a female author breaking into the industry by adopting a male pseudonym. Uh, Andre Norton, as she's commonly known in science fiction, uh, still reprinted and republished under this name, was actually Alice Mary Norton. She also adopted another pseudonym here, Andrew North, uh, as well as a few others. Um, but she was a really prolific writer. Um, she wrote several novels, as well as contributing to pulp stories. And you can see here, this is actually cover art on this issue for her story, The People of the Crater. And it's the lead story for this issue. Some really great artwork there too. So the heyday of pulp science fiction was from the 1920s through the 1940s. They still continued to make pulp magazines into the 50s and 60s, but they were declining. So authors had to look for other kinds of popular venues to publish their work. Sort of implausibly, or maybe unexpectedly, uh, Playboy was one of the many popular magazines where science fiction literature was being published. Uh, so here we have an issue of Playboy, which is the first publication to publish this story, Nine Lives by Ursula K. Le Guin. And you can see that perhaps because of the kind of magazine that it is, maybe this was an editorial decision or an author's decision, we're not really sure. Uh, but here, Ursula K. Le Guin is listed as UK Le Guin. So they used initials to uh, obscure her gender in this particular work. Through the 40s, 50s, and into the 60s, women started to create some spaces for themselves in pulp science fiction magazines as editors as well as authors. So here we have a great collection of uh, fantastic and amazing stories. These were all edited by Celie Goldsmith, also sometimes under the name Celie Lally. Uh, she was a prolific editor and one of many, Judith Merrill, C.L. Moore, there were dozens of female editors who uh, worked their way into the pulp tradition, either through the mainstream magazines like this or sometimes through fanzines. And that created opportunities for other women authors as well. These three issues here all contain 
short stories by Ursula K. Le Guin under her own name. So here we have her story, April in Paris. I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to the Gothic Fantasy Collection here at W.D. Jordan Rare Books and Special Collections. If you would like to access any of this material firsthand, I encourage you to visit our website, which is available through the Queen's University Library website, and to contact us with the titles that you might want to see firsthand. We're available Monday to Friday between 8.30 and 4.30. And we always encourage people to contact us a little bit ahead of time because our material is not in the general stacks and it must be retrieved. So if you give us 24 hours notice, for example, uh, we can ensure that that material is ready and waiting for you upon your arrival. Look forward to seeing you at WD Jordan Rare Books and Special Collections.